Hey, uh, today I just wanted to do a quick video and code walk through uh, describing how HIP is so fast and how it can support being bound to interfaces with, with high bit rates, like you know 40 gigabits per second, 100 gigabits per second, without coming to a crawl. Basically, we try to avoid using libpcap and instead use this great technology called eBPF. And with, with libpcap, there's a couple shortfalls um, for this type of application because while we can use BPF filters in libpcap to limit what traffic we're capturing, uh, we, we can't then prevent sweep attacks. Like we basically would have to capture everything instead of just being able to filter for the ports we want. With libpcap, it also sends the whole protocol header up to user space. You can clamp the size of what's sent, but it still sends the whole headers, which isn't ideal. But with eBPF, we can deploy our own type of program from user space to kernel space, and we can do whatever we want. So HIPD uses eBPF to deploy basically a protocol header parser, and what that does is it will extract data and just the data that it needs. So what, what we're really after is just two things, the source IP address of every incoming packet and the destination port of every UDP datagram within each packet. So we only care about those two things, source IP address, destination port, and we write those to a ring buffer. And this ring buffer can be picked up in user space by the HIPD application. Just to quickly cover ring buffers, it's just a way for us to asynchronously write and read data. So we, from the kernel space, we can write to it, and whenever the user space program is ready to read from it, it can. So today, uh, I'm basically going to be covering the protocol header parser portion of HIP, which I think is the most interesting part, to be honest with you. It's the part I had the most fun with. So the, the protocol header parser is written in C. We've got a couple imports up here, as you can see. The first one here is vmlinux.h. So what this is, this is a really interesting file. It's, it's very large. Basically, it's generated using something called BPF tool. If you have Debian, you can install it with sudo apt install BPF tool. And basically, this is going to write our BPF type format information into a header file for C that we can consume in our application. Then we have some helpers. I won't go too much into these, uh, but basically they just help us perform some operations for BPF, which we'll get into later. And I'll also get more into this VM Linux file a little bit later as well. So the first really interesting part is this knock data structure here. Uh, this is basically a representation of the data that we're going to send up to user space. So like I said, the source IP address, destination port. And then this, this has to be like a multiple of four bytes. So we have to add some padding at the end here as well. Next up, we have the ring buffer. So this is the data type that, this is the structure that's provided by eBPF to communicate back up to user space. So we, we, anything that we write to this can be read by our user space application. And then finally, we get to the meat of the application. So this is the XDP or Express Data Path attach point. This is basically a very, very early attach point where we can read data pretty much hot off the wire before it even hits the, the Linux kernel networking stack. So this is before IP tables, this is before anything really processes the incoming data. And XDP, they, they give us this XDP context that we can read data from. It gives us a, a pointer to, to the beginning of the data and the end of the data. This is important so we can both read the data, but also perform validation that we were able to read all the data that we needed. Um, now, all of this code is in the critical path. Like it's every frame coming off the wire is being processed by this code. So we need to be very efficient with what we do here. So the very, the very first thing that we do is we do a quick bounds check. And this is just checking if the size of the frame is larger than 60 bytes. The reason we want to do this 60 byte size check is because any frame that's coming in that's part of a port knock sequence will not have any data in it. It's just going to be the headers. So your typical 1500 byte ethernet frame, for example, we just ignore and we return early with this XDP pass. And XDP pass is just an action that the eBPF program can take. Now, every single return that we do in this program is going to be XDP pass. And the reason is, is because we're not trying to do anything with this packet. We're just trying to observe it. We're not trying to filter it. We're not trying to change it. EBPF can do all of these things. We can edit this data right now if we wanted to, but 
we just want to keep forwarding the frame through the rest of the the kernel protocol stack and let whatever happens to it happen. So this will eliminate probably 99.9999999% of the frames that are coming in here. Next up, this is where things finally get interesting. Like I said, we need to get the source IP address and the destination port, but we're just being given a raw bitstream of an ethernet frame. There's no structure around it. It's literally just a stream of, of ones and zeros at this point. So we need to take that stream and unpack it all the way up the stack from the data layer to the network layer uh, to the transport layer in order to pull out all of what we need. Really keep in mind, we just need the source IP address and destination port. So in order to get the source IP, we need to get at least up to the network layer and the destination port is all the way up in the transport layer. So we need to go at least that high. Uh, the rest we don't care about at that point. So we're gonna go all the way up to the transport layer, walking up the stack. Uh, so first of all, we're gonna parse the ethernet header. Now this is where vmlinux.h comes in. Uh, vmlinux.h contains the data types that we need in order to do this parsing. So if we look at the struct for eth header, uh, we can see we have a field for destination and source MAC address, as well as the ether type. Um, and if we compare this uh, structure to you know a reference of of the Ethernet header, we can see that there's some missing fields. Uh, that's because things like the preamble and the start frame delimiter, uh, VLAN tags, um, etc. They're they're all they're all stripped at this point, like it's thrown away at this point because it doesn't matter. It's not important data. So once we have the ethernet header, we've read that in, we have to do a quick check on the size of the data that we've read. And we have to make sure we haven't read more than what we have essentially. Uh, Cause what, what could happen is this, this could have been cut off. Uh, maybe we, we ran, we read past the data, maybe an incoming frame somehow was shorter than the frame should have been. Maybe the wire was cut, I don't know. I don't know if that would actually get through at this point, but uh, basically we have to do this length check to make sure that we're, we're in bounds. So at this point, we've now stripped off the layer two headers and we're now gonna go into layer three and look at the IP headers. If we look at the IP header structs in vmlinux.h again, we can see all the IP header fields. And if we compare it to a reference diagram of what an IP header looks like, we can see all the fields are here. It maps nicely, they're all in order. Uh, one thing that I noticed though, and I, I thought was very interesting at first, is that, uh, well, I still do think it's interesting, but uh, the IP header length and version fields, they're, they're mixed up, they're swapped in uh, vmlinux.h. And I, I think it's really interesting why, but uh, basically it comes down to this thing called endianness. And it's the, the order in which a sequence of bytes is stored and read. Uh, most computers, they use little endian to store and read the least significant bits first, but network communications, uh, they, use, they use big endian to transmit the most significant bits first, which is the opposite direction. Why, why is that? Why is there two different uh, ways of storing and reading uh, byte ordering? Well, I, I don't really know. <laughs> but from, from what I do know, it's, it's specified in RFC 1700 that... This is the way that uh, network streams are sent and read. They're, they're a stream of bits from the very start to the very end. Um, they left a, a good reference for their reasoning. But again, it, it really comes down to opinions, nice to haves for programmers, uh, just being different from the needs of network transmissions being a bit stream. So I, I recommend checking out the document. Uh, it's IEN. 137, the title of it is On Holy Wars and a Plea for Peace, if you're interested in learning more about Indianness. Okay, so coming back to VM Linux, looking at the IP header length and version fields, they're swapped. This is because of the Indianness. So if you, if you notice that these fields are four bits each, all the others are at least multiples of eight bits, but these, these, are, these two make up the same byte. So they must be swapped here, basically, is, is what it comes down to, just because of that whole Indianness thing. All the other fields are multiple of eight bits, so it's just those two. And um, so once we've read the IP header into this struct, we then do the same size check that we did earlier with the ethernet header, make sure that we got the whole IP header and we didn't go past the end of the data. And if we did, then we return XTP pass, and then we keep going. So now that we have the IP header parsed, we can look at the protocol field of the IP header 
and we want to make sure that it's UDP. If it's anything other than UDP, again, we return XDP pass because we only care about UDP frames at this point. Next, we have to parse the UDP header. Once again, go back to VM Linux. We can look at the data type here. We have a source port, a destination port, a length and a checksum. That maps exactly to what you would expect from a UDP header reference diagram. So now we have everything parsed that we need. So finally, we just pack it all up into a knock data struct. Uh, we have to do the endianness thing here. So these are helper functions that help convert to the correct endianness to big endian from little endian. And we also have to write our padding at the end. Uh, so once we have it all saved in the knock data struct, we write that to the BPF ring buffer, and then we're done. That's it.